Well, it looks like uh, it looks like our webinar has started. I can see um, at the bottom here the number of participants incre increasing. So we'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those of you who uh, don't know me, because I think we've got some people outside of the MFEA on the line here today, I'll say that my name is Phil Ferrari. I'm a Senior Assistant Attorney General for DMFEA, and I want to thank everybody for joining us today for this presentation on the American Bar Association's criminal justice standards, and in particular, the standards for the prosecution function. Most of you who um, registered for this should have already received a link, link to the prosecution function standards. If not, you can easily access, access them on the ABA's website. Um, to discuss the standards with us today, we are very fortunate to have three distinguished presenters, all of whom have had uh, significant involvement in putting together the prosecution function standard. I'm going to introduce them in just a moment, but first a couple of words about how we're gonna to proceed today. We're hoping to complete the presentation in about an hour and 15 minutes, but we'll see how it goes. Um, we'll start uh, with each of our uh, guests giving a brief presentation covering uh, an overview of the standards, use of the standards in practice, interpretation of the standards, and forthcoming um, some words about the forthcoming published commentary on the standards. And then following that, we're going to try to address some of the standards that might be um, particularly applicable to our day-to-day -day work as prosecutors. Um, and we may be able to um, address a few hypotheticals uh, in relation to those as well. As we go through this, if you have any questions, um, please don't hesitate to go ahead and press the Q&A button at the bottom um, of your screen there, and you can type the, uh, your question in there, and that will be um, relayed to us, and we'll try to address those as we go along. Um, I should note that this presentation is being recorded, and it will be made uh, available to the public. Uh, going forward as an aid in understanding and using the standards. And that's really um, our goal for today. If you are unfamiliar with the criminal justice standards, we want to introduce them to you. Uh, if you are already familiar with them, hopefully you'll learn something more about them. And we hope that you'll all be encouraged to use them as a resource in doing the really critically important work that you do. Uh, so I'm going to start by um, giving a brief introduction for all, all three of our uh, panelists. First, we are joined by the Honorable John R. Thunheim. Uh, he is a United States District Judge who has served as a federal judge in the District of Minnesota for nearly 27 years. He was the Chief Judge of the court from 2015 to 2022. Before his appointment as a judge, he served for near, nearly 10 years as Minnesota's Chief Deputy Attorney General and two years as State Solicitor General. He has devoted much of his judicial career to helping develop the rule of law in new democracies working in over 40 countries, including working on drafting the Kosovo Constitution. Judge Thunheim is currently a member of the Judicial Conference of the United States. He has been an active member of the American Bar Association for 30 years and is a founder of the Government and Public Sector law Lawyers Division. And maybe most relevant to today's presentation, Judge Thunheim was chair of the Criminal Justice Section's Task Force on revising the prosecution and defense function standards and is currently um, a member of the CJS Council. We are also joined by Ms. Melba Pearson. Ms. Pearson is an attorney specializing in civil rights and criminal law with an emphasis on policy. She is the director of prosecution projects at the Gordon Institute for Public Policy and co-manager for the Prosecutorial Performance Indicators Project, which is based at Florida International University. This project aims to bring more transparency, equity, and racial justice to the criminal justice system. Ms. Pearson also serves as adjunct uh, faculty in the Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice. Before joining uh, Florida International, Ms. Pearson spent three years as Deputy Director of the ACLU of Florida, where she worked to change police practices, expand voting rights, and reform the criminal justice system. Previously, she was an Assistant uh, State Attorney in Miami-Dade County for 16 years, culminating as assistant chief in the career criminal robbery unit, uh, supervising junior attorneys while also prosecuting homicides. She serves as vice chair of the American Bar Association Criminal Justice Section, co-chair of the Prosecution Function Committee, president of the National Black Prosecutors Association Foundation, and vice chair of the Florida Justice Center. She regu regularly provides legal analysis for court TV, law and crime, local networks, and through op-eds that have been published in the Miami Herald, Washington Post, and other national outlets. She's the editor and author of the book called, Can They Do That? Understanding Prosecutorial Discretion. 
And she hosts a web show, uh, hashtag Mondays with Melba, and a podcast as the resident legal diva. And finally, we're joined by Professor Rory Little. He is the Joseph W. Kochet Jr. Professor of Law at UC Hastings College of the Law, where he has taught for 30 years. He practiced law as a criminal trial and appellate lawyer for a decade prior to teaching and still practices as of counsel at McDermott, Will, and Emory. He teaches legal ethics, um, which also known as professional responsibility, as well as criminal law and constitutional law courses. In the field of legal ethics, Professor Little has served as the reporter for the ABA's criminal justice standards for prosecution and defense functions since 2007. Previously, he served on the ABA's Standing Committee on Professional Responsibility, considering amendments to and opinions regarding the ABA's model rules of professional responsibility. He also serves on the ABA's Standing Committee for Amicus Briefing at the United States Supreme Court and other courts as well. Professor Little served as a law clerk to Judge Louis Oberdorfer on the United States District Court in Washington, D.C., and then at the United States Supreme Court for retired Justice Potter Stewart and Justices Brennan and Stevens. He practiced law for a decade before teaching full-time as a trial lawyer for the United States Department of Justice Organized Crime uh, Strike Force, as chief of the U.S. Attorney's Appellate Section in San Francisco, and also as a criminal defense attorney. And I believe me when I tell you that is a slimmed down version of the really impressive credentials of all three of our panelists today that we're so lucky to have with us. So we'll go ahead and, and begin by having each of our panelists provide some introductory remarks. And we'll start with Judge Thunheim and an overview of the prosecu prosecution function standards. Thank you, Phil, and welcome everyone. It's great to be with you here today. Um, unfortunately, it's snowing heavily in Minnesota, but uh, that's probably a little uh, note to all of you. Um, I'm happy to talk about the standards. I did, as Phil noted, uh, serve as the chair of the task force on the prosecution and def defense function standards. Uh, this was an extraordinary effort to rewrite the original standards, which date back to, I think in the 1970s, Rory will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but they had not been thoroughly revised. And this was an effort that from start to finish with the task force, a, a brilliant group of prosecutors, defense lawyers, academics, judges, who worked for quite a number of years. Uh, Rory was the uh, reporter for us and did uh, much of the writing. And then it went to the standards task force or the standards uh, committee of the criminal justice section before going on to the section and then eventually to the ABA. So this document, which in my view is the best document that a prosecutor can ever have on their desk. It has loads of good information, good suggestions, essentially best practices. And you will note when you start working with the standards that they do not use the word shall or shall not. They use the words should or should not. And that's important because the standards are aspirational. They provide good, solid guidance for prosecutors, and they really represent what the American Bar Association in its collective wisdom, and particularly the criminal justice section, which is, in my view, a jewel of the ABA, is professional conduct that prosecutors should engage in uh, all the time. They are what we would normally call best practices, and they are sometimes cited by courts, I have cited them on occasion, including the United States Supreme Court. So they are looked at uh, at all levels of the justice system and you should know them because they're very helpful. I will note uh, that they are intended to generally be consistent with the model rules of professional conduct that's been developed by the American Bar Association and they do not in any way modify the obligations that prosecutors have under rules, under statutes, or the Constitution. And uh, they, I think in order here, sorry, my equipment, my technology is failing me today. Uh, give me one moment. There we go. 
Okay. So when they were being drafted, I will express a, some a level of frustration that there were members of the task force that wanted to make uh, the standards identical to the model rules of professional conduct. And uh, Rory will remember this debate, but in, uh, in truth and honesty, they are not identical to the rules of professional conduct. You all know your obligations under the rules, but the standards go beyond the rules to really focus on ethical and aspirational good practices and good conduct. Uh, they are among many criminal justice standards that have been approved by the American Bar Association. If you go to the criminal justice section website, you will have access to all of the standards that have been approved in this really rigorous uh, process. Now, let me uh, do a general overview of what the standards cover and how they're organized, because I think it's helpful to, to know this. Part one, uh, of the standards are general standards, which are applicable to prosecutors, such as the duties of a prosecutor, who is the client, uh, and especially the heightened duty of candor. It addresses conflicts of interest and bias, uh, diligence, relations with the news media. Uh, part one is really a good overall guide. And I'll mention also that it will not take you long to read through these standards. This is not a book of five or 600 pages. This is easily accessed and read on a regular basis, which I recommend. Part two addresses the organization of the prosecution function. Uh, this includes hiring, uh, office policies, procedures, removal of the chief prosecutor, other issues that come up from time to time in prosecutor offices. Paragraph or, uh, Part three addresses relationships. Now relationships are important for a prosecutor in so many different ways. Relationships with law enforcement, defense lawyers, the courts, uh, victims and witnesses. Uh, these address really good practices for how to maintain the best possible relationship that you can with each of these entities. Part four focuses on investigations and charging decisions, including whether to seek detention and importantly, the conduct of plea negotiations where I know there are often many questions that are raised. Part six is court hearings and trial, including civility and selecting jurors and the presentation of argument and witnesses. Part seven uh, is post-trial motions and sentencing. Sentencing is especially pro uh, important, I think, for new prosecutors to study. Part eight is appeals and other conviction challenges. And I will note for you that you should also uh, spend some time looking at the defense function standards. They are organized in the same manner, which makes it easy for you to compare. And I think it's always helpful to know what good practices on the other side uh, are. So what is the purpose of the standards uh, and why are they important? Well, we hold prosecutors to a higher standard. There is no question about that. Uh, I, along with perhaps every judge I know, holds prosecutors to a higher standard. And these standards collectively describe what that higher standard is. It's not written in one sentence. It's not written in two sentences. It is written in the prosecution function standards. These are the higher standard that we expect of prosecutors who possess enormous this power in our criminal justice uh, system and the, the need to be fair and reasonable in all respects. All of us have, um, let me also add that the standards address many of the gray areas not covered by the rules of conduct and possibly not covered by the rules of your office or by case law. Uh, so if you're worried about the gray areas that you're not sure about, 
you can be certain that the standards have at least attempted to address these areas. I think all of us, and I was a, a deputy attorney general for a long time in my earlier career, all of us have paused for a moment and thought, is this the right thing to do? I know it's permitted. I know I will not get in trouble for it. It probably even follows the rules of my office. But the question in my mind is, is this the right thing to do? And I think the standards will help you decide what is the right thing to do? How to be an ethical and fair and really truly outstanding prosecutor. How to make sure that when the defense bar talks about prosecutors, they say, that prosecutor is tough, they work hard, they are a very able opponent, but they are fair in all respects. And that's what you want defense lawyers and judges to say about you. Prosecutors use the standards I think for an occasional read through, having them on your desk is a good place to have them. And they use the standards to look up an area where they need competent advice. And chances are the standards will address them. There is uh, in the past, the first version, there's commentary to the standards. I think Rory will discuss the fact that he is working on further commentary to these standards and commentary is always helpful. And I will tell you that as a judge, I require prosecutors who are going to try a case before me to read them. And then I ask them on the record whether they have read the prosecution function standards of the criminal justice section of the American Bar Association. And so there's a record. I, I figure that's the easiest way to make sure that they will answer the question for me. And uh, I encourage uh, US attorney's offices to utilize them and for a while, I was actually giving copies of the book to new prosecutors. I'm not sure if it's still available in book form. Uh, perhaps it is. Uh, I know it's available online, which is where many of us reside nowadays anyway. And it's probably easier to address. You can get to it in probably 30 seconds. It's really fast. So I encourage you to read through the standards. Read through the defense function standards too, because that will give you a good idea of what ethical conduct is on the other side. And don't be expecting that this is the, these are the rules. Don't, expecting, uh, don't expect that these are statutes. These are guidance, good practical advice, good practices for being the best prosecutor that you can be. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Professor Little, uh, Ms. Pearson, do you have any um... Anything to add to Judge Tunheim's overview? Um, I would just say I absolutely love that the judge has um, the parties, hopefully the defense as well, read through the standards because again, it sort of sets the tone of how you expect both parties to move forward in litigating the case and how they treat each other and how they treat the various parties that are going to be involved. So I think that's a great way to either introduce people to the standards that may not be aware of it or to give a refresher um, and hopefully make for very civil <laughs> proceedings ideally. And I, I'd like to think that that's been working really well for you, Judge. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> I just wanted to add, um, to underline uh, something that Judge said, um, courts rely on these standards. I think some, I used to be a federal prosecutor, and sometimes you hear lectures from ethics people, you say, well, why do we care? The only rules we have to follow are the, you know, rules the court has adopted, and, and these standards haven't been adopted, and, you know, this is an hour of CLE credit or something, but why should I pay attention? Courts listen to these things and read these things all the time, not just Judge Tunheim who had a personal involvement, but when a court is confronting a hard question and isn't sure where to find authority and they don't find it in your ethics rules, uh, they'll go to the standards and cite them. They've been cited over a thousand times by uh, various federal and state courts. They've been cited by the Supreme Court a couple dozen times in support of various rulings. Um, so they're worth uh, paying attention to. We say in the introduction that they are not intended to be a basis for personal discipline. They're not intended to be a basis for civil liability, but that doesn't mean courts won't look at you and say in a specific situation, well, what about this ABA standard? You could have done that or something like that. So it's really worth paying attention to. 
Um, and and I will say in the in the Q and A box, if you if you're able to look at it, uh, uh, Linda Britton, who's our wonderful staff director for the standards at the ABA, has posted the prosecution function standards. Um, I think she's going to also post the defense function standards, which are in many regards parallel. Um, and an article by Judge uh, Marty Marcus, uh, which is written uh, now almost 10 years ago, which talks about how the standards are developed by people from all sides. So they're kind of a best practices because they're of agreement by everybody and how they've been cited so often by various courts in support of various rulings. So those might be useful sources for you as well. Thanks. All right. Okay. Well, now we're going to uh, turn to Ms. Pearson um, to discuss how she utilizes these standards, both as a practitioner and as somebody who, um, in the course of her work, actually regularly talks to students and the public about how about the criminal justice system as a whole. Great. Thank you so much for that, Phil, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm going to kind of approach it from the perspective of just pulling out a few of the standards and the ones that I think that are most important to highlight. Now, when you do your review of the standards, there may be others that jump out to you as being incredibly significant to what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. But, you know, I'm just going to share a couple of my pick and top picks and, you know, and I'll share a little bit of the reasons why. So the first one I'm going to start with is is all under section three, uh, 1.2 B, which is the primary duty of a prosecutor is to seek justice within the bounds of the law not merely to convict, and that a prosecutor serves the public interest, should act with integrity and balanced judgment, increase public safety by pursuing appropriate criminal charges of the appropriate severity, and also by exercising discretion to not pursue criminal charges in the appropriate circumstances. The prosecutor should seek, and this is my favorite part, the prosecutor should seek to protect the innocent, convict the guilty, consider the interests of victims and witnesses and respect the constitutional and legal rights of all persons, including suspects and defendants. So to me, this one is a reminder of what the role of a prosecutor is, right? Because so many times when you end up in those discussions, when you're, you know, coming out of court and, you know, you, you just had a trial and the question is, well, did you get a guilty, right? And, and yes, of course, you want to see the culmination of your hard work to result in a conviction, right? That's, you know, that that's part of being a prosecutor. But at the same token, sometimes a not guilty verdict is justice. It may not feel that way to you, right? Because you've poured your heart and soul into it. But we also have to keep in mind that a conviction isn't necessarily the be all and end all. And, you know, the good thing is, as I've seen in, in the course of my work, I do a lot of data and transparency work around prosecution, that more and more offices are moving away from this, you know, conviction mentality and looking more towards how are we serving the community? Sometimes the defendant needs something that the jail cannot provide. Maybe they need mental health treatment. Maybe they need uh, help with addiction. Maybe they just need a job. You know, there could be any of a number of reasons that could be fueling why they are in front of you and why they are involved in the criminal justice system. And this particular standard reminds us to think more broadly about that. Also, which I'll touch on again later, is about considering the interests of the victim and the witness, considering, not taking as gospel, right? Because, you know, at the end of the day, when it comes to victims and witnesses, yes, you have somebody who had gone through, you know, as, as per the charging document and all the evidence you have, you know, you may have somebody that has gone through a horrible traumatic event. But at the same token, they may be asking for or demanding something that is just not commiserate with the crime. I mean, I can't tell you how many times in burglary cases, you know, I had victims or survivors coming in and saying, well, I want life for that person. Well, the statutory max is 15 years. So no, no, you're not going to be able to get life, right? Uh, and, and you're not even going to get the 15 years either. In all likelihood, a reasonable um, resolution based on the person's history and the severity of the crime and what was taken, et cetera, et cetera, 
five year state prison might be you know, appropriate. Or it may be that the person is suffering from a severe addiction and that's what's causing them to break into homes. So they needed to go to a, a rehab program, right? So these are some of the things to remind us not to be necessarily beholden to any particular party, but to always be beholden to the truth, to the constitution, to what's right. Because too often there's so many demands on our time, on our bandwidth, and demands on, well, we want to see this because we have a political agenda, or whatever the case may be. We have to be able to tune out all that noise and focus on what's right. Uh, also, another one is uh, 1.9C. And this is one that I don't think is often talked about, but it's the prosecutor should not unreasonably oppose requests for continuances from defense counsel. So sometimes it's easy to, you know, you've got your case ready, you're ready to go, you've got your, your, your victim, you've got your, uh, you know, law enforcement officer, you've got all the relevant witnesses, your DNA has actually come back in a timely manner, you are ready to go to trial, right? But the defense is like, no, I'm not ready, I need another continuance. And you can get frustrated and you're just like, listen, you're just trying to delay the process just because we have to be very cognizant of the fact that there may be a number of things going on on the defense side that has nothing to do with, you know, with our readiness, right? So thinking about the fact that maybe they're trying to chase down a witness that could provide an alibi for the defendant. They may not feel at liberty to share that at that juncture at the time that they're asking for a continuance, but there could be additional investigation that they're doing. And by pushing for that defense continuance to be denied, you could be inadvertently causing an issue where an injustice can occur. So, you know, we have to really be thoughtful about when we're opposing defense continuances. And I think that's something that does come as we become more senior in our career. I think, you know, when we're a little bit more junior and filled with vim and vigor and, you know, want to fight everything to take everything to the mat, that this is a, something that we should be considering right that well maybe not every continuance is a bad continuance and you know there could be really solid reasons why the defense wants a continuance to be able to better prepare the case or come back with a better plea agreement whatever the case may be um another one of of importance i think about is uh 3.4C, which is the prosecutor or the prosecutor's agents should seek to interview all witnesses and should not act to intimidate or unduly influence any witness. I want to talk more about the first part, which is about the prosecutor should seek to interview all witnesses. Because I've seen many instances where folks have fallen into that, okay, if I talk to the lead detective, I talk to the victim, and I talk to the crime scene person, I'm good. All right, that's enough for me to be able to file the case, right? And while theoretically, yes, that might be enough, that might get you to, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt. It, 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 it's a better practice to try to talk to as many people as you can that are listed witnesses and also inquire of your law enforcement officer, your lead detective, whoever the case may be, if there are other people that were present. Because everyone has an angle of the story to tell. And there could be differences with nuances that you might be missing that could affect what charges you end up filing. That could affect the type of plea that you may offer. That could affect if you're even going to file charges at all, right? And again, I think it's just a matter of habit and also, and let's be realistic, we all know that caseloads are out of control and that people's time frames are and, and bandwidth are really taxed. But we shouldn't be cutting corners because if we do, unfortunately, justice can end up being the victim of that. Um, just kind of raising through the rest a little bit more quickly. Um, you know, first of all, making sure this is 4.3a that I'm going to be talking about, that a prosecutor should be filing charges only if supported by probable cause, and that the admissible evidence is sufficient to support a conviction beyond a reasonable doubt, and, and that the decision to charge is in the interest of justice. So it's not just about, oh yeah, I can prove that there's probable cause, I'm good, I can file. It's not, okay, well, every, everything I have, I can totally prove this beyond a reasonable doubt. It's fine. No, no. You should be considering all three, which is, is there probable cause? 
can I prove this beyond a reasonable doubt? But even though I have the first two, is this really in the interest of justice? Is sending this person through the process really going to make the victim whole? Is that going to be a sufficient enough deterrent or address the underlying driver that brought the person into the system? Why exactly am I charging this case? So it's encouraging us to think a little bit more critically when it comes to charging and why we're charging, thinking about more about the bigger theory, the bigger picture of this. Um, you know, touching very uh, briefly on pretrial release, um, 5.2a talks about the prosecutor should favor pretrial release unless detention is necessary to protect the community, protect individuals, or to you know, make sure that the defendant returns for future proceedings. This is something to consider, especially as uh, bail reform becomes a bigger issue around the country, people pushing for pushing for bail reform, people pushing back on bail reform and saying that this doesn't keep the community safe. You know, thinking about all of these things with regards to what's really going to protect our communities. Um, and then the last one in this section before I talk about some racial implications is that 5.6D, a prosecutor should not set unreasonably short deadlines or demand conditions for a disposition that are so coercive that the voluntariness of a plea or the effectiveness of defense account, excuse me, defense counsel is put into question. Of course, you can set a reasonable deadline before trial or hearing for an exception for acceptance of a disposition offer. The thing I want to focus on there was about coercion. So when you set, you know, there's often a practice of, hey, if we plea this out at arraignment, I can give you my best deal just so that nobody has to go into depositions or, or move forward or anything like that. But the problem with extending a plea at the time of arraignment is that the defense and the defendant doesn't really know what they're pleading to, right? They don't really have a full grasp of the evidence that's available and that the evidence that's going to be presented against them at trial. They haven't had the opportunity to investigate the case and identify alibi witnesses or surveillance tape that may show a different aspect of the crime or, or call the defendant's culpability into question, right? So we have to be cognizant of that as much as that we want to dispose of cases, do so equitably and reduce our caseloads, we also have to think about what's also in the interest of justice. And is this a reasonable deadline in light of what the discovery process is at this point? And again, I'm speaking a lot of this from a Florida perspective and somewhat from a national perspective because I practice in Florida, but also you know, I am cognizant of the fact that discovery requirements are different in each state and, and all of that. But so I'm gonna talk more broadly about that. But just keeping in mind, if you're going to extend a plea offer to do so in a, with a reasonable reasonable deadline and not be like, well, you have until the end of the weekend to give me a response because that can end up being coercive because the, the defendant feels pressured and is like, I'm just going to take this plea because I don't know what's going to happen after that. So it's about keeping that in mind. Um, we were asked to talk a little bit about uh, issues of race and how the standards intersect with that. Um, very quickly, 1.2, uh, the prosecutor should be knowledgeable about and consider uh, develop and assist in developing alternatives to prosecution or conviction. So that's speaking to uh, mental health courts, uh, different subject matter type courts, as well as diversion, and also looking at restorative justice, other community-based programs that could be well-suited to address underlying issues, and that can also, in the end, reduce racial disparity by making sure that people get the assistance they need, especially if they reside in an under-resourced neighborhood or have other have been locked out of other opportunities due to being of a particular group, due to being marginalized, et cetera. So this is why some of these programs are so incredibly important in leveling the playing field and making sure our system is equitable. Um, also, a uh, prosecutor's office, and this is 1.6b, uh, should be proactive in any efforts to, uh, to detect, detect, investigate, and eliminate bias, um, and that a prosecutor's office should regularly assess the potential for biased or unfairly disparate impacts of policies. This is a reminder that a policy could be race neutral on its face, 
but in application can create disparities. So that's why it's really important to collect data with regards to the pleas and, and how people are being treated and how cases are being resolved based on geography, based on defense counsel type, based on you know any of a number of different issues, how often hate crimes are being prosecuted, all of those things, because looking at those hard, cold numbers will be able to give you an indicator as to, okay, we may have a problem over here, or this particular policy can be driving problems that we don't intend to happen. So how can we best work with the community to be able to address those issues? Um, also training, which is found in 1.6b. Again, making sure that you're training not only on legal doctrine, but understanding the consequences of what your work can have, right? So visiting a prison so that you understand where people are being sent, you know, understanding the historical context of certain things that have happened in your community and why certain communities may be reluctant to come forward and speak to the police or why they may, you know, if, if something happens in a particular area, if there's a historical significance and how that may play into your prosecution. Also having people with lived experience come in and give lectures and and really share their experience with prosecutors because again it gives you a different viewpoint that may be very different to your own um, and then lastly do just touching very quickly on uh, prosecutorial discretion and who the prosecutor works for 1.3 states very clearly the prosecutor serves the public and not any particular governmental agency law enforcement officer or unit witness or victim so while you listen to law enforcement, you listen to the victims and witnesses, you have to do what's right. And your the public's best interest and views is what should be represented, not what a particular officer or detective wants. And then tying into that is 2.2a, prosecutors should remain a respectful yet independent judgment when interacting with law enforcement. Your client is justice. Your client is not a person. You don't bow to pressure from victims, from law enforcement, or anyone else. You listen, you be respectful, but nowhere does it say in any of these standards that you are bound by the wishes of a law enforcement officer, a victim, or a witness. Now, your state may have a different uh, take on that, and there may be different ethical rules to that, so make sure to be mindful of it, but at the end of the day, your client is justice. And with that, I turn it back to you, Phil. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pearson. So that, that covered a lot of ground there. Um, Professor Little or Judge Tunheim, do you have anything to add or, or kind of comment on in response to that? Judge, if you have something, go ahead and, and, and then I'll say whatever I have to say in, in my remarks that are gonna come next anyway. Yeah, I thought that was an excellent overview of some really important parts of the standards. And thank you, uh, Melba, for going through those, because I think they're very, it's very important to understand how prosecutors use uh, these standards. Uh, and I think that was what was pointed out so well in her commentary here. So I thought that was great. Rory? Well, I thought it was great, too. Uh, uh, Melba's facility with the standards by their numbers and their subsections is amazing. Uh, I spent 15 years trying to write these things and get them passed, and I'm not sure I could do the same thing. So, uh, and and I, I guess I want to sort of maybe use that as a jumping off point to say to you prosecutors who are listening or whoever's in the audience, um, you know, it's not a long thing to read these standards. On the other hand, it's not just one page. Uh, there's 39 pages of standards here. Uh, the standards have, there are 57 different standards for the prosecution and the standards all have subsections. So there's over 200 little subsections. You can't know them all. You can't memorize them all. You can't read them all, I think at one sitting. Um, so my suggestion is to try to have them at hand. And when you have specific issues, go back in and dip into them I thought I'd hold up a copy. This is what the little book looks like, the, the, the red book. It's the little red book. It's not so little, it's about so thick. Um, you can find these online used. 
I, I think the ABA also still sells them. This is the third edition. This is not the fourth edition. We're talking about the fourth edition. That's only available right now online. I think the ABA may be waiting for me to finish commentary to publish them in a book. Um, but it's worth having uh, because you can't know them all. Um, I thought uh, just to just to say a couple of things. So the first thing I want to say, Melba talked about the idea that you know you shouldn't unreasonably oppose a request for an extension uh, or, or or continuance, and that's certainly what the standard says. I think it's very important to maybe use that as one example. We tried to have standards that are parallel for both defense and prosecutors. So there is an exactly the same standard for the defense side. They too should not unreasonably oppose things when the prosecution needs them because your witness hasn't shown up or your expert hasn't shown up. Um, it, they both also say that you should never use a request for continuance for purposes of nothing but delay, that you have to have some other reason. Uh, that that just using the system to delay things is is not uh, viewed as the proper use of the system. Um, but it's important to read the defense standards. The, the, the difference between this edition, the fourth edition, and the prior editions. This edition has very parallel uh, standards for both sides. The idea is that all lawyers in the criminal justice system should be, in a sense, held to the same standard, unless we have an affirmative reason to to not do that. So for example, we say that the prosecutor has a heightened duty of candor, uh, while the defense has a more constrained duty of candor because of course they have a loyalty obligation to their client and a confidentiality obligation to their client, uh, whereas prosecutors are traditionally viewed by judges and the public as sort of representatives of the truth. Um, and so there's a difference there, but in most cases they're the same. So you need to look at them both together to really get a flavor. It's not all just, we say things prosecutors can't do. The other set says we say things defense attorneys can't do. And they, they're roughly similar. Um, I wanted to say that, uh, underline another thing that was said by the judge, these are aspirational in the sense that they're not binding, uh, but they are viewed as best practices. That is, our committees that, that adopted these standards had really uh, vigorous representatives from the defense bar as well as the prosecution and, and judges who said, wait a minute, both of you stop. Judges have some interest in this as well. Um, and we had law enforcement experts, we had uh, forensic experts at certain points. Uh, so it's important to recognize that these are the result of a whole lot of people agreeing ultimately on language that was viewed as pretty specific and careful. Um, they may not be adopted as rules, but courts might use them. Um, I wanted to say a couple of things about general thing or specific standards uh, like Melva did. I think one thing she mentioned, we added this standard 1.6. When we added this back in 2015, there were not bar standards that said you can't exhibit racial bias and you need to be conscious of racial impact of your practices. Um, now, I think the larger ABA and lots of other bar associations have adopted things, and that's all for the good. I think it's important to recognize that prosecutors often will adopt policies which not only are race neutral on their face, but they are intended to be race neutral, but yet they still have a disparate impact on various populations. And that's where this standard says you need to think about that. You need to do a review of your policies. If you've decided to concentrate on drug possession of a certain type of drug, you need to see is that desperately impacting one community versus another. Uh, the, the, the old example is crack cocaine versus powder cocaine, but today there are other uh, drugs. Uh, if, you're, if you're saying we've got to crack down on a certain practice or a certain neighborhood or a certain area, uh, you have to at least think, are we doing this in a way that is uh, balanced and not going to desperately impact one group versus another? Another standard talks about you should be in relationship with your community. You should be talking with your community. Prosecutors in particular are representatives of the entire community, not just any particular party. Um, and so when there's a policy that's going to be adopted, it's a good thing to talk about what the impact of that might be with regard to certain communities and listen to what those communities say after you've had a few months of concentration. Uh, so that's that's an important part of the standard that, that, that's brand new. Out of the 36 standards in the prosecution function set, 12 of them are new. 
So about a third of those standards are new from the third edition. So that red book that I showed you doesn't have about a third of what this new edition has. Um, so for example, for the first time, it actually tries to define who the client is and say very specifically, as Melvin noted, it's not law enforcement. You're not working for the agencies. You're not working for the police. You're not working for the victims. You're not working for the witnesses. You may be furthering their interests in, in pursuit of the public interest, but your overall job is to do the right thing or protect the innocent, convict the guilty, any way you want to put it. It also talks about prosecutors as being problem solvers. Sometimes the answer to the problem of crime in a community isn't going to be just be harsher in your prosecution policies. There may be creative solutions. Um, individual cases will benefit from considering alternatives besides prosecution, besides uh, incarceration. They're sentencing alternatives, uh, non-prosecution agreements. Um, the, uh, the idea that, um, uh, let me just pick one that's new. Um, the, the one that I think is most important, again, Melba touched on this, is this idea that there are minimum requirements for filing charges. And, and the general attitude is you got to have probable cause. Our standard says you got to have probable cause when you start, but you can't continue it unless you believe you're going to have uh, admissible evidence to prove it beyond reasonable doubt. Just saying, well, I got probable cause isn't enough. You need to really believe you can prove it to a jury in your community by beyond reasonable doubt. Um, it also talks about the fact that if a prosecutor has doubts about guilt, they should bring this to the attention of a supervisor. I'll talk about a duty of supervision in a minute. Um, and, and that it's perfectly okay. Your office needs to encourage a policy of disclosure within its own colleagues. Uh, it, you, you can't view it as weakness if a prosecutor says, I got concerns about this case. I got problems with this witness or this expert or this evidence. Uh, that should be viewed as a good thing to raise those issues with your colleagues, with your supervisors, and make sure the office as a whole believes it's right to do what you're, whatever you're doing. In, in some instances, a, a, an individual prosecutor might think we shouldn't go forward, but the office will, as a matter of community collegial discussion, decide that it should go forward. Uh, that, that, that prosecutor could be relieved of that case. Uh, it shouldn't be viewed as a bad thing. If, if something like that happens. You're gonna have reasonable disagreement among prosecutors on certain types of cases. Uh, and fostering the consulting for advice and, and supervision is a good idea. There's a duty to seek out supervision when you're not sure. There's a duty to supervise if you're a supervisor and not just, not just say, well, so long as your, your, your monthly report says you're making progress, I'm fine. Uh, it's to actually evaluate what your people you're supervising are doing and make sure that they are doing the right thing too. Uh, so I think this, um, by the way, there's one standard at the end of this 4.3, it says a prosecutor's office should not file or maintain, this is something you should evaluate all the way through, charges if it believes the defendant is innocent, no matter what the state of the evidence. These are cases where you know you've got enough evidence, but you, you just don't believe it. Um, that's a fair case to bring to the attention of your, your office and say, you know, yeah, we got three witnesses that do an eyewitness ID, but boy, I think they're all really shaky. Uh, and for other reasons, I think this person might not have done it, that kind of thing. Um, other new standards, just briefly, is a duty if after a conviction is final and evidence comes to your attention that suggests that maybe that was not the right result, uh, you have a duty to disclose that. You have a duty to bring that up. You can't sit on it, you can't hide it, you can't ignore it. This is really hard for prosecutors, especially if it's two, three, five years later. Um, but you see newspaper headlines now where people are being released uh, after many years because DNA evidence or whatever comes up and, and the original prosecutor might have known something and didn't say anything and now those prosecutors are being pursued. So you gotta, you gotta be attentive to make sure the result you thought was right when you got it continues to be the right result. It's okay. conviction integrity units in some offices are a good idea. Um, there's also one that, uh, this is just an important title to recognize. 8.1 says the duty to defend conviction is not absolute. Um, a lot of, I was a prosecutor and when somebody filed a motion to vacate the trial result or vacate the plea or whatever, my first reaction was to oppose it. Um, it's not your, you don't have to. You can actually evaluate things on their face and see what you think. 
And if they make a good point, uh, you might want to do something else. Um, and I've, that's happened to me as a prosecutor when, when a mandatory minimum sentence just seemed like far out of line with what the driver of a car should receive. It, it happened to me on appeal when at trial, I had a trial judge visiting from another district who said, nobody gets to cross-examine the co-defendant. The co-defendant has testified, they're done, no cross-examination. That was a violation of the Sixth Amendment right of the other defendants. <laughs> and we had to admit that on appeal, even though we had the result in hand. So these are just some basic thoughts and sort of pick and choose. You can find lots of things in these standards that we haven't talked about and mentioned. If you're able to look at them while we're talking, you might want to ask questions in the in the uh, in the question and answer uh, period. Let me say one last thing about commentary. So I'm in the process of writing commentary. These were adopted ultimately in 2017. It's five years later. Why isn't there commentary? Well, first, I think the standards themselves tell you a lot. So to some extent, you don't need commentary to tell you what they mean. Uh, second, commentary is going to be really long. If you think 200 subsections of standards is long. The commentary is going to be three times as long. Um, and, and the third thing to keep in mind is just because a reporter like me and an ABA committee says, here's what the standard means or here's how it ought to be applied, that's not going to be binding. Uh, it's this text of the standard. So don't wait for the commentary to read the standards. Don't wait for the commentary to decide what you think they mean. Talk about it with yourselves, with your colleagues with your offices um, and see whether doing what Judge Thunheim uh, does already would be a good thing for your office. Like maybe you ought to circulate it to everybody in the office and, 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 and you know, have a little prize party where people get awards if they can <laughs> name the right standard or something. Anyway, Phil, I'll let you uh, take, take over again. Thank you, Professor Little. And I'll, I'll take the liberty of just um, saying how much I appreciated the points you made. Um, about really fostering a culture where people feel comfortable in terms of raising concerns they have about particular cases. You know, from a supervisor's point of view, your ability to help is limited by what you know. Um, and, um, you know, unless there's really kind of this um, feeling that these discussions are kind of welcome and encouraged, um, um, our ability to kind of make joint better decisions is really limited. And I, I feel really grateful that I think at the department, we're doing a good job of, of, of cultivating that, but it's something we really need to make sure we continue to pay attention to. Um, so I, I really thought that was an excellent point. Um, Ms. Pearson, Judge Thunheim, do you have anything to, to add to Professor Little's comments? I, I would just add that uh, one, one particular uh, standard that I've been talking about with a lot of new prosecutors lately, and that is, 3-1.9, which requires a prosecutor or suggests that a prosecutor should act with diligence and promptness to investigate and to litigate. Uh, oftentimes, new prosecutors are somewhat reluctant to move forward. It takes them longer. They're worried about bringing a case that they might lose and cases get sat on for a long period of time. For some reason, this has become an issue that I always am talking about with prosecutors. It is important to dispose of cases in, in a, a, a prompt manner. You can't sit there for a long period of time. And that's 3-1.9. I think that's one of the better uh, standards that uh, I recall our, our debate about. So many times I've heard, we just need some more records, Judge. Well, that's not, good enough in my view. You need to move forward with what you got uh, or decide not to bring charges or to dismiss, dismiss charges if you cannot uh, uh, forecast uh, enough evidence to uh, convict someone. So I think that's important. And I would also emphasize, uh, Rory held up the, the book. The first book that we were dealing with uh, from the 1970s, we made a lot of changes. It is almost completely redone. The changes, in the understanding of the prosecutorial function since the 1970s is astounding. We know so much more today. We're so much more focused on uh, good practices and doing the right thing. And this is, is really a wonderful document for all of you to have. And you know, with that, I, I would um, co-sign uh, Roy's comments around supervision. 
right? Because in, in my experience, um, I remember that a lot of my division chiefs and supervisors were mostly as a result of winning the war of attrition. And it doesn't make them bad people. It just means they're amazing trial lawyers, but they weren't necessarily selected for supervisory skills. So I, I just want to caution folks, you know, especially if you're in decision making process to be a or, or decision making role in the office is to be sure that supervisors are adequately trained to be able to give that feedback, right? Because yes, you have a duty to supervise, but your supervisor has to have the tools with which to be able to provide that kind of constructive feedback as opposed to, yeah, yeah, you got this. I've got, I've got four homicides I need to try. Good luck, but you got this, right? And then it's a situation where it ends up almost being the blind leading the blind because then you ask your fellow, you know, your, your fellow prosecutor who may be of the same level as you and may not necessarily have a strong grasp on the issue at hand. So we have to make sure that supervisors truly are able to supervise with lower case loads, not as a penalty, but just to have the bandwidth to spend the necessary time training their, the prosecutors under them and alerting them to, hey, this is a potentially a problem. You know, I know you can't see it yet because you're only a year in, two years, three years in, but I'm going to flag this problem for you so that you can learn from it and be able to teach other people effectively as time goes on. You know, if I, I could respond to one thing that Judge Thunheim brought up in terms of uh, in the need to avoid delay and try to move things expeditiously. Um, I can tell you that in California, on a broad scale, we're experiencing um, issues both in, in terms of advancing our investigations and our filed cases because of um, you know, our, our ability to take steps during the pandemic with respect to investigations, our ability now in terms of crowded courtrooms, uh, crowded courtroom dockets, the inability to get trial dates, that sort of thing. Um, I think it's a it's a problem that we're experiencing and, and really frustrated throughout, uh, by throughout the, um, the state. Um, and I guess it's 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 worth keeping in mind that kind of as a as a system we all have to try to work to address that. And it's not just you know that we want to um, that we want to uh, get this done quicker and kind of move it off the books, but that that you know the quality of justice sort of depends on the on the speed with which we're able to to proceed. Um, so I think now we may, um, uh, we, we're almost at the hour mark, but I think we're gonna try to address at least just a few kind of specific um, standards and, and um, uh, just kind of point some, a few additional ones out. Um, one that we wanted to highlight starting off, and it's sort of um, kind of a specific example of the higher standard that applies to prosecutors is uh, standard uh, 3-1.4, which is the prosecutor's heightened duty of candor. Uh, which states that in light of the prosecutor's public responsibilities, broad authority and discretion, the prosecutor has a heightened duty of candor to the courts and in fulfilling other professional obligations. And it's probably worth noting that, you know, all lawyers have a duty of candor under California's rules of professional conduct. You can't knowingly misstate law um, or misstate um, the facts or fail to correct what you know is a misstatement. You have to directly, uh, you have to disclose directly adverse legal authority and you can't knowingly offer false evidence. Um, so it's worth, worth thinking about the fact that if that's, you know, the, the rule that applies to all lawyers, you know, how is it that our duty is actually heightened and what do we have to do that, that you know, might go beyond that? And one, one area where I think it's helpful to kind of think about that um, in particular um, is in relation to ex parte communications with the court, which in our, um, in our practice in DMFEA, since we have vertical prosecutions, we, we actually work um, through the investigative process before actually charging. So we're working with agents when we're submitting affidavits with respect to search warrants. And of course, we work with the agents when they're doing the declarations for the arrest warrants as well. Um, uh, but how that duty of candor affects us um, in that circumstance. Um, and so I, I wondered if I could maybe, um, and actually that, that is specifically um, addressed in standard 3-3.3b, but I wondered if I um, might turn to Judge Thunheim and just kind of ask if he had any specific thoughts about kind of the duty and candor in general and, and how that might apply in particular in that, in that ex parte um, uh, scenario. Uh, thank you, Phil. And ex parte communications are very, very delicate. Um, even when they are authorized, 
uh, they raise the appearance of impropriety to many people. If uh, someone sees, uh, happens to see prosecutors walking into my office, for example, there will be an immediate assumption that there's something going on here that is uh, not appropriate. Um, and so I do think there are instances where uh, prosecutors are obligated to tell something to the court that they may not uh, disclose to the other side. And that's where the duty of candor comes in. Uh, judges want to know what is going on. And so uh, if there is administration related matters, say for example, you have a big case and the prosecutors wanna come in and say, this is how we would propose that we handle this case. They, they better invite a defense representative with because that's my first question that I'm going to ask. For, this is just administration of the case. That's okay, we can talk about that, but I want to have a defense uh, counsel here. But the court expects prosecutors in ways that are not expected of defense counsel to be open and honest with the court. And if it's something that you feel cannot be said to a defense counsel and it's authorized to talk to the judge, that is fine but you should always tell the other side that there has been an ex parte discussion and this is the general reason why. I don't want uh, one side to guess about what the other side is doing with the judge. And I certainly don't want someone to wonder about the uh, propriety of my meeting with prosecutors. And so when I have a nice long discussion with the US attorney, I like to have the federal defender there as well. So we can have both sides talking about uh, matters of justice that are important to the system. Uh, so the duty of candor is really important, but it, it is also tied up with ex parte communications, which uh, even when authorized uh, are concerning to most judges. Yeah, I mean, Phil, that's, that's, it's nice of you to link this because this is an important part about how to use standards or rules in general, right? 1.4 has to do with the duty of candor and then 3.3 .3 has to do with the relationship with courts and by their titles you wouldn't say oh there's a link there but when you read the details of 3.3 .3, this the the second and third subsections both discuss ex parte uh communications and so linking those uh is a really smart idea the other thing that i wanted to say is you can sort of tell what it means to have a heightened duty of candor versus the defense counsel's tempered duty of candor by comparing the defense function and the prosecution function standards. So the prosecution function standard says the prosecutor should not make a statement of fact or law that the prosecutor does not reasonably believe to be true. And then it says to a court, to a lawyer, to a witness, or to a third party, it basically says to anyone, don't, don't say something to anyone even if it's your local grocer <laughs> or your, you know, or your, your squash partner or whatever you do, uh, you know, don't, don't, you've got to, you, people are going to hold you to that standard in all your works of life. And if you don't like that role, then don't be a pro public prosecutor is, is really the, the attitude. The defense side says something a little different. It says the same thing. Don't make statements that you don't reasonably believe uh, to be true. Although it says knowingly not believe. So that's the first difference. You got to know it's not true for the defense side, just not just believe it. And then it says for the defense side, it's not a false statement of fact for defense counsel to suggest inferences that might reasonably be drawn from the evidence. In other words, it's perfectly okay for a defense lawyer to argue to the jury that they should acquit, um, even because that's if it's a reasonable inference from the evidence, even if even if the defense lawyer believes the client is guilty, that's not the defense counsel's role. Uh, I think it is the prosecutor's role uh, to not let an FBI agent just tell their story, whether it's true or false. Uh, if they think the uh, law enforcement agent's testimony isn't true, they shouldn't put it on. And if it is put on, the standard of the prosecution says you should correct it if you think it's not true. So the, the difference is that we all sort of feel intuitively maybe when we're doing our jobs, uh, needed to be spelled out a little bit in these standards they weren't spelled out before and that just you know super super quick when i'm thinking about candor to the court i think about the gray areas 
So I think about, for instance, you're in court, the judge says, state, are you ready? And you know, you, you, your victim's a little dodgy. I mean, you talked to them about two weeks ago, but you're not positive, but you also don't want to let the defense know that your victim may not be available because then that could result in the defense asking for a speedy trial or something like that. So now how candid do you need to be? Right. So it, it's those sorts of gray areas that that always strike me, as well as, for instance, well, what's you know, your suggestion, Melba? You, what <laughs> got to answer that question? <laughs> I know, but my suggestion is always like, listen, I mean, let, let the chips fall away th where they may and say, listen, you know, at this juncture, I'm not ready to proceed. I've had recent contact with my victim. I'm just not able to proceed at this juncture. I'm just asking, and that's what you do the whole compromise. I'm just asking for a really short continuance, judge. I am just, I will have a better understanding of what's going on if you reset this one week, right? And then you, and as, as that's happening, you're texting your investor investigator to run to the person's house and knock on their door right but but you but you're still being candid with the court by saying I've had recent contact which is in fact true you spoke to them a week before in this particular scenario but you don't presently know if they are available to come in that day so that that but that's one of the gray areas that I could see you know a, a, a different prosecutor being like oh yeah you know judge yeah yeah I'm, I'm ready knowing that the defense is probably going to ask for a continuance and then okay who defense right, defense right. continuance we're all right. good to go. it's not right. poker you can't just call their bluff you exactly. gotta you gotta be candid right and when the defense attorney's client doesn't show up and the judge says where's your client do you know where your client is you don't have to answer that by giving them whatever you know you can say your honor that's a matter between my client and me and i'm not able to answer the court's question you can say things like that uh, but you, but but saying something that's not true is a, <laughs> is wrong. <laughs> yeah, I think it's always better to inform the court accurately what's going on. Courts, you know, are are well aware of the fact that sometimes the defense lawyers will take advantage of a situation and can prevent that. But if you say you're just not ready because you haven't had a chance to get ready for for trial, you're probably going to hear no to the continuance. But if you're having trouble with uh, locating a witness that's critical to the court or to the trial, the court will probably say it's okay. We'll take a continuance. Well, and just before we leave this uh, uh, area, you know, uh, um, three uh, dash three point three B um, in terms of ex parte um, submissions and communications. Um, it does actually specifically go beyond just being completely truthful, but also providing additional information that, that's going to be necessary to put the court uh, in a position to make a fair and informed decision, including facts that are adverse. So um, th that's a situation where we can't have, you know, defense counsel come in and sit down with us when we're presenting something to the judge. But, but this standard puts us under this specific duty to provide uh, additional information, ad information that may be harmful to us in addition to what we think establishes probable cause to put the judge in a position to make a fully um, informed uh, and fair decision. Um, and, and Phil, let me, let me just underline that. Sometimes the judge will know more than you think they know. And, and you, you do not want to get caught in that situation. I had an ex parte appellate argument where the judge, one of the judges asked me, well, why would the trial judge have made this decision that you're appealing. I was a prosecutor. Why would the judge have made such a silly decision? And I tried to give an honest answer as to why I thought the judge might have made the decision, even though it frankly didn't reflect well on the prosecution. Turned out later that trial judge had clerked for the judge who was asking me that question on appeal. And, and, and believe me, there was some communication, I think, between them. And so had, you know, so had I not answered that in a way that I thought was fair, even though it hurt my chances, and that I think is often gonna be true with these ex parte. You've gotta tell a judge in an ex parte search warrant context or whatever, whatever the negative side might be, uh, so that later there's not gonna be a backbiting on, on you and, and your case. Yeah, the, the language in that, uh, that part B there is important. Material facts known to the prosecutor, including facts that are adverse. That's just, that's your, that's your duty to inform the judge. Right. I'm a big fan of the layering technique, though. You start with the good, you slide in the bad and say, but I can distinguish this 
from, you know, there's this adverse case, but I can distinguish it with this, this, and this, and then you end with a positive. So you're being candid, you're putting everything out there, but at least you're still presenting it in a context like, listen, judge, yes, there's these adverse things out here, but listen, I can distinguish it. My facts are different and this is why. So And, and Melba, you're making a really good point, which is these standards are not designed to hamstring anybody in their practice. And, and, and their ethical and fair practice of law and pursuing the public interest, these, these standards are not designed to hamstring you. You should know what they say and act within them, but that doesn't mean you can't act as a zealous advocate for your position. Well, the standards in fact require that, that you be a, a zealous advocate uh, as a prosecutor. And that's what we expect. I also wanted to uh, circle back to a couple of the um, standards that Ms. Pearson um, spoke about in her opening remarks. Um, she talked about um, the uh, relationship with law enforcement under 3-3.2, uh, um, the, the need for the prosecutor to, to maintain um, independent judgment when interacting with law enforcement. She talked about uh, standard 3-1.3, which covers uh, the client of the prosecutor and specifically states that you know law enforcement um, uh, that are investigating the case are not the client of the prosecutor. Um, and she may have talked about uh, standard 3-4.2, uh, which talks about decisions to charge are the prosecutors. And while the decision to arrest may in, in certain circumstances be made by law enforcement, the decision to institute formal criminal proceedings is the responsibility of the prosecutor. And as I indicated earlier, I think that this is um, an area that's of particular relevance um, to our department because we, uh, we have the great fortune of having our own sworn law enforcement agents that we have the opportunity to work with and that are devoted to our cases. Um, but sometimes, you know, we, we build up necessarily and properly these, these great relationships with them, and that can make it difficult sometimes to exercise that independent judgment that's referenced in these standards. Um, and so I thought I'd, I'd, uh, I'd ask uh, Ms. Pearson and, and, and our other panelists um, to consider that in light of sort of a hypothetical we thought out, which is like, you know, you've been working on this case forever with this agent. It's maybe taken longer than you thought it was going to. You just don't think you're there yet. And you ask the agent to go out one more time and interview one more or two more or three more witnesses, just to, just to sort of nail down a certain corner of it. And uh, the agent says, fine, fine, fine. But, but you know, if the agent says what we think the, the um, if, if the witness says what we think the witness is going to say, that, then we're going to charge, right? That's, I, I can take that to the bank. Um, you know, it seems like a reasonable sort of question kind of in a vacuum, but, but how, how should we respond to that, that, that sort of uh, scenario? So, Phil, I have to laugh because I was notorious for that. <laughs> I was that one that they were cursing at when they were like, she's making me go out again. She's making me get one more thing. I'm like, dude, I gave you a list to begin with. So, <laughs> but you know, if a, a, a law enforcement agent says to you, okay, if I bring you this, are you going to file? The answer is, you know, I can't tell you that right now. I have to look at everything in the totality after circumstances, because if I reread maybe the, you know, sworn statement of the second witness you brought in, right? And I hadn't looked at the case maybe or looked at that statement in two months. And I read it again in the context of what this new witness says. And I'm like, wow, this is diametrically opposed. Even though they said what we thought they were gonna say, in my review of the case, I realized, oh no, that these facts don't match up. Now I'm in a position where I can't file. And I've now given this law enforcement agent my word that I was going to file. So of course that could lead to number one, not only the, the agent being upset, but who knows if the agent's gonna go back to the victim or the survivor of the crime or the next of kin and say, hey, the prosecutor says, if we can nail down this one last person, this case is going forward. Now you've created false expectations. So you know now you're in this huge ethical bind and you may feel pressured. Well, wow, I've really got to file this and that may not be the right thing to do. So you should never assure any outcome, not only to a law enforcement agent, but also to a victim. Because so many times victims have said, you know, like, we're going to get a guilty on this, right? Or they're looking for you in some way to promise an outcome. And you, all you can say is, listen, I'm going to try my best, 
I'm going to fight like, you know, like heck for you. But at the end of the day, it's in the hands of six or 12 people that make a decision. The judge has the right to be able to toss out certain parts of the evidence if it's not, you know, doesn't uphold, the you know, not constitutional. So you can't make these promises because there's too many outside factors. It's unethical, it's wrong, and it creates false expectations, which is more damaging to the justice system, as well as your personal reputation as a prosecutor. Yeah, we changed yeah. the title of the standard. It used to say decisions to charge. Now it says the title is decisions to charge are the prosecutors. And we changed that title so that a prosecutor can wave that to an agent and say, look, uh, th these are my decisions, not yours. I'm bound by this standard. <laughs> Judge, I'm sorry, you go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, I think 3-3.2a uh, really says it all very succinctly. The prosecutor should maintain respectful yet independent judgment when interacting with law enforcement personnel. You, know, you, you, you couldn't write that better. That's really the, the ultimate in, in the standard there. Respectful, yes, of course, they're, they're your allies, but independent judgment is absolutely critical. And then I, I, I know we, we are uh, nearing our time limit, but I wanted to address um, uh, decision to charge and prosecutorial discretion, which has been um, discussed by uh, some of our uh, panelists previously. And, and uh, I wanted to point out that, you know, it was, it was discussed previously that under 3-4.3, uh, the, the ABA standards require not just probable cause, but uh, a belief that admissible evidence will be sufficient to support a conviction beyond a reasonable doubt, and that a decision to charge is in the interest of justice. It's, it's worth noting that that does go beyond what the California Rules of Professional Conduct 3.8a um, require, which is just probable cause. Um, and Standard 3-4.4, discretion in, in filing, declining, maintaining, or dismissing criminal charges, sets forth a really long list of factors that it says may properly be considered in deciding whether to bring or maintain a charge. And so one question I wanted to ask our panelists was, you know, if we're doing our job, uh, trying, to, trying to consider all of these uh, properly considered factors and looking at each case um, and each defendant and each set of circumstances kind of on its own, um, how do we also try to seek some sense of kind of uniformity, some sort of um, sense of, you know, predictability in terms of, you know, what kind of conduct is going to is going to warrant what kind of charges, because I think that's really important as well. And I'm just interested in, in, in your thoughts on that. So one thing I can say is there's another standard which says that an office should maintain kind of an office handbook. Uh, and I think it's perfectly appropriate for an office to say, here's the general standards we're going to use to charge this kind of crime. Here's the general level of evidence or here's the general you know it used to be common to say this th this amount of drugs and below that amount we don't charge or this or above this amount we'd look for a harsher sentence that kind of thing uh, i i don't think there's anything in the standards that says you shouldn't have such general policies um and 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 it encourages the office to maintain those policies new prosecutors in particular have to get something that allows them to compare you know, three or four of the same type of case, which they might well get uh, and make decisions. I think on the other hand, it's very clear from the standards that every case is to be individually evaluated uh, and that there's nothing wrong with uh, cases that can be explained that have different results uh, when, when factors that are relevant and important uh, are different. Um, I think it's always gonna be true that you can uh, critique uh, offices in general and say, well, the, I've got two cases three years apart and they seem really similar and you did different things. Even that can be a change, right? A cultural change. Um, but I think uh, you, it's, it's a mistake for, I think the standards will give you this idea. It's a mistake to strain for too much uh, e equality without being able to exercise your independent discretion. But it's, it's a good idea to have standards which generally cabin cases within certain levels of offense and levels of evidence. And I, yeah. I don't jump in. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say standard 3-2.4 is somewhat general, but it does uh, indicate the objective is a fair, efficient, and effective enforcement of criminal law within the prosecutor's jurisdiction. 
So it does suggest uh, this and also suggests that a training on the standards is really important for all prosecutors. Go ahead, Melba, sorry. Yeah, and I was going to not piggybacks perfectly because I was going to go back to the importance of training and supervision as set forth by the standards because that's how you get uniformity, right? If you're if all the supervisors are trained on, you know, th these are the types of charges that we believe jail is appropriate unless there's extenuating circumstances. These are the types of charges that should always get diversion or the majority of which should get diversion or, or some of the problem solving court, right? If the supervisors are clear on that, then they can ensure that in their courtrooms or the people that they supervise, they are following those types of guidelines. Because again, you can have a policy, but if nobody looks at it and if nobody knows where it is, it kind of doesn't have a purpose, right? So that supervision is important, as well as training. You know, most offices have monthly training, some have quarterly, but, you know, monthly is, is, is probably more of the norm. And again, that's when you're educating not only folks on the standards, but also policies and policy shifts and types of different things to consider. Because again, discretion gets honed over time. No prosecutor is born with the, you know, with, with the discretion and knows exactly, okay, boom, when I see this case, this is exactly the type of outcome that comes with being trained with being going into different permutations losing things at trial losing motions winning that's how you gain that experience but if you have those senior folks that have gone through that and keeps imparting that knowledge on a consistent basis one-on-one -on -one, as well as in more general trainings that's where you'll be able to see that uniformity come and you know policies of review to go back and look at cases and see whether they have been handled appropriately over time uh, with some level of uh, equality or, or consistency. Um, policies of uh, the, the top prosecutor being kept informed as to how things are working. I mean, uh, there are offices where the top prosecutor doesn't do anything other than go to, you know, monthly dinners or something and. And all and the, the the people below them do all the work, and that's a bad idea. Uh, that's a, you ought to force your top prosecutor to to to, to hear what the office is doing. Uh, so there there are lots of uh, these. If you if you read these standards as a whole, you can develop an ethic on how to make this happen. But you know this is the problem with sentencing guidelines, at least in the federal system. They, we want uniformity. We want uh, disparity, unwarranted disparity, not to happen. At the same time, we want discretion. And I don't know a single federal judge who hasn't, at one time or another, confronted a case that looked like it should be decided in X way under the guidelines, and yet it's not right to them, and they they depart. And I think we now have a, a formal policy from the Attorney General, as well as the Supreme Court, has endorsed some version of this that. There has to be discretion for departures from policy when the circumstances warrant it, so long as the improper factors aren't, inter, you know, nepotism, right? It's my cousin, uh, race, um, age, other things uh, should not be a factor. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes a, a very youthful offender, a very elderly offender might be viewed as somewhat different. So it's a balance. All right. Well, thank you for that. Uh, we're approaching our, our deadline here. So uh, before wrapping up, um, do, do any of the panelists have anything they'd like to uh, sort of add in conclusion? I, you know, Phil, I just wanted to ask whether your audience, I mean, if anybody's still listening out there, uh, you could hit that Q&A button and ask a question. Uh, you don't have to just sit there and absorb it. Uh, that, uh, but I don't have anything particular to add, uh, Phil, that I can think of. I, I think we went over uh, everything, not everything, of course, because the standards, as Rory described, are, are, are somewhat lengthy, although I think it's, a, it's an easy read because this is the work that you do every day, day in and day out. You'll recognize the dilemmas uh, for which there are uh, suggestions, there are guidelines. There may not be complete answers, but complete answers are impossible because every situation is different. But this is, this is your world. Spend time with these standards. They're really, really helpful. And they're the product of an enormous amount of work arguing over virtually every word in, these, in the, in the uh, standards. 
So I think you'll find them to be very helpful and you'll be a better prosecutor as a result. And Phil, we should also say that uh, Linda Britton is our uh, staff supervisor for these, the ABA criminal justice section in general. I have an email which is public out there. You can just Google my name at UC Hastings. Uh, we're always prepared to answer questions from people if they've got them along the way. Um, you, I may give you my answer as my answer. It's not adopted ABA policy, but I'm always happy to receive questions. Same here. I really appreciate that and um, really appreciate the, the work of Linda, uh, who uh, without her um, willingness and enthusiasm, this would not have happened today, that's for sure. Really uh, appreciate the time from our panelists who are, are so busy and have been so generous with their time um, and their expertise with us today. Really, um, really appreciate that. Um, and just to uh, um, back up what the panelists have said, you know, we chose to talk about the prosecution function standard today because that's kind of the most generally applicable one to the things we do. But there are standards that the ABA publishes on a variety of criminal justice topics. And I really encourage you to spend some time um, uh, on the ABA website and looking at those different standards and, and, and taking a look at the, the, the ones that are applicable to, to the work that you're doing. There's a so, whole separate set of standards on investigation by prosecutors, which are which is really worth, they're incorporated by reference in this in our standards. But those are really worth reading. And, and Phil, I also want to compliment your office and you in particular for bringing the ABA into your office and letting us try to proselytize on these standards because they're not going to have any effect if people don't study them and, and, and think about them. Well, thank you. All right. Well, let's see, do we have one question? We have, we have, a, we have a thank, a thank you. So. <laughs> I, I see a question here that says it would be helpful to address the Duke lacrosse matter. Um, <laughs> and I'm sorry, uh, Linda Kingsbury, that is a, such a funny question for me because we have debated whether to put the Duke lacrosse example into the commentary or not. And uh, <laughs> some people think it's a good teaching hypo and other people say it's so old, people don't remember it. I don't know what the right answer is. No, the right answer is Jackie Barnhill in Georgia. Okay. The Maud Arbery case. That's what I mean, and not that it's complete, but yeah. she has been, you know, removed from her position. She's been charged. And there was, you know, some very clear guardrails that she smashed head on into. So yeah, that might be a more current example. Right. All right. Well, I think I think uh, we'll, we'll conclude with that then. And, and thank you again. And I hope everyone has a very pleasant evening. Thanks, Phil.